Uh, so the final case study for the ecosystems unit, uh, the living world part of the course, is looking at uh, hot desert environments and looking at the difference between uh, rich and poor hot deserts. Before we move into that, I just want to quickly look at the adaptions of desert vegetation. And it's something that could come up, could be a nice easy for market if you get the opportunity. So. You know, we take our traditional kind of idea of a desert plant and we go for our catkus. Okay. Traditional kind of cartoon style catkus. Now, uh, you know, we've got a huge number of uh, adaptions that we can think of here. If we start from the bottom up, the first thing we want to consider is the root system. Now, the things, with, uh, things like the Saguario catcus is there are two uh, major types of roots. Firstly, it's got long tap roots. These tap roots go down into the water table to find water deep down in the ground. But at the same time, it has roots that go out along the surface and are very shallow. These are designed to get any water before it is evaporated off the surface if there is any rain. Okay, moving our way up. Now, we can refer to... Uh, cactuses as things called succulents. So succulents are uh, 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 a species of plants you know, designed to live in arid conditions uh, because they can store water either within their fleshy tissue or actually inside them. And uh, things like the Sagraria cactus are hollow so that water can be stored inside them. Now also we can take this idea of the skin being pleated. So the skin's pleated, that allows it to expand to uh, make the area inside larger during periods of heavy rainfall so it can store more water. We also have, you know, as we know, cactuses are spiky. These spikes are designed to reduce water loss. They've got less surface area than the leaf, so not only do they ward off predators or um, people who want to maybe get access to the water inside the cactus, but they actually reduce water loss. Um, other trees or other plants in the desert, such as the Joshua tree, don't have spikes, but do have very small leaves to reduce the water loss. And the other thing is that they have a waxy cuticle. This waxy cuticle, again, helps store water and reduce water loss during the hot desert conditions. So, now we want to look at our two case studies. And the first things we want to look at are the uses of them. Okay, or the... Uh, the economic opportunities available in the two deserts. So, what are our two case studies? Okay, first off is our example of our poor desert. We've got the far desert in India. Okay, it goes across the border to Pakistan as well. And then we've got the Mojave Desert in America, famous for uh, having Las Vegas in it. Now, the big thing to note straight away is the difference in terms of the uses or economic opportunities in these. And really, the way to remind yourself of this is the scale. In the Mojave, all of the uh, major uh, kind of development and uses are on a large scale. Whereas in the far, they're generally on a much smaller scale. So that's kind of the big thing. If the question asks you to compare, that's the first point you should make. You know, so if we were to take, for example, mining. Yeah, I show mining as a kind of little pickaxe. Mining does actually occur in both our rich Mojave Desert and in our poor Far Desert, but for very different materials. In the uh, Mojave Desert, they're mining for on a large scale for expensive materials such as gold. Whereas in the far, it's from much cheaper materials such as gypsum, which is used in the uh, creation of uh, cement and um, other sort of cheaper products. So that's one big difference. We can then take the farming. Okay. Um, generally, in the far desert, the majority of farming is subsistence farming. So growing a small number of crops to uh, maintain your family. Uh, might be going crops or quite regularly also cattle farming. 
Whereas in the Mojave, all of the farming is normally commercial farming. We've got commercial versus subsistence farming. And commercial farming, you know, things like cotton plantations and uh, fruit trees. There is some smaller commercial farming in uh, the far desert. And that's been uh, allowed to develop due to the creation of a canal through the desert, which is allowed for irrigation. But as I said, the majority of farming is subsistence, much smaller scale. Now, another similarity between the two is that they both make quite significant money from tourism. Now, uh, the tourism in the Mojave Desert is on a really big scale. You know, you've got big tourist attractions such as uh, Las Vegas. Okay, with their casinos. And, you know, when we talk about the casinos, we're looking at a gambling revenue of somewhere in the region of about $9.7 billion a year. Other attractions are 4x4 driving and hiking in uh, Death Valley National Park. Okay. Also, another thing they can offer, uh, you know, quite amazing because in the middle of the desert, is 61 golf courses. Yeah, and they actually hold things like the um, Accenture Match Play Tournament, which is one of the biggest uh, tournaments in world golf uh, in Las Vegas. So, um, obviously, you know, big attraction, uh, tourist attraction there. On the other hand, if we go to the far desert, it's much smaller scale tourism. Yeah, you're looking at things such as camel rides. Yeah, and I apologise, I cannot draw a camel. There we go. And you're looking there at a price per camel ride of 500 rupees. So obviously, much, much smaller scale farming, uh, smaller scale tourism, not going to make anywhere near as much money from that as they do the 9.7 billion dollars of revenue in Las Vegas just from the gambling. Now this is where perhaps the similarities start to end because obviously the economic opportunities and uses are much greater in uh, the Mojave Desert. We've also got things such as uh, renewable energy, things like solar power and hydroelectric power. Um, you know, you've got the Hoover Dam okay, which uh, goes across the Colorado River it uh, provides power for over one million people. So you know, that's a really nice economic opportunity that can sell that power back to the grid for these renewable energy sources. And then one of the other, perhaps slightly stranger things, is um, a place in the Mojave Desert called Sun City. It's just on the, right on the edge. Okay, and it's a, a retirement town. Elderly people move there, you know, they like the fact that you've got this nice hot climate, really dry conditions. And 85% of the population in Sun City are over the age of 65. That means um, you know, these people, they've got uh, a huge amount of money to spend. And the, you know, the grey pound, they've not normally got their uh, mortgage to pay anymore. They've got a lot of leisure time. So they can spend a lot of money in the local area. They're normally generally very wealthy. So the local economy does well from such, having such a large number of elderly people in Sun City. So what we need to look at is how, are, how is economic development and the use of the Far and Mojave Desert being managed so that it's sustainable. Now again, you know, very different uh, attempts of management due to the difference in levels of wealth. But there is one similar characteristic in that both are national parks. That means that you have education and also park rangers occurring in both of the deserts to protect them by law and to provide education on how best to preserve their natural environment to visitors. So that's one big similarity. Now if we go and look at Las Vegas and the Mojave Desert and how they've managed that, if we take the tourism first because obviously you know, massive income from that but we know that tourism can have a negative impact on the environment. So one of the things that it's done it is zoning. So for example, activities like the 4x4 driving okay, have been zoned into activity into areas away from the most vulnerable um, uh, species and habitats in Death Valley National Park so that they do not disturb them. Now one of the other really nice strategies they've implemented is something that they call the cash for grass scheme. 
Now the Kashra grass scheme is basically a way of, uh, uh, in the authorities in the Mojave Desert, are encouraging people to replace their lawns, which obviously need regular watering in the hot desert climate and therefore use up huge amounts of water, with fake grass or astroturf. And they actually give them 50 cents, so half a dollar, for every square foot of lawn that they replace. Now this has been really successful. It's seen a reduction in water usage by 20% since 2000. So that's been hugely successful. Uh, on top of that, you know, we're not going to go into it here on the diagram, but we can see other things such as uh, mines have obviously reopened uh, with new technologies allowing them to get to gold, and obviously the tourism industry and the gambling industry provides a huge amount of employment in what would otherwise normally be quite a low uh, employment area. However, there are obviously quite a few things that suggest that, man that development is still not sustainable. Uh, for example, the Colorado River, which is dammed by uh, the Hoover Dam, an example of one of our renewable energy, uh, that's only a trickle by the time it reaches Mexico because of the amount of water that's been taken out of it. Lake Mead, which is the lake directly behind the dam, is at its lowest ever water levels. And for the last 40 years, more water has been taken out of that lake to uh, provide water for Las Vegas than has actually been put back in naturally. Other things that suggest it's not particularly sustainable are the Salton Sea, which is an inland sea in the Mojave Desert. Um, water extraction from that has resulted in really high salinity levels, so the salt content in the water is really high, and that means lots of uh, species of birds uh, are dying and fish that used to live in the lake. So what they've done in uh, the far desert is also on a much smaller scale. One of the things they've done is planted trees that are designed to live in desert conditions. There's lots of advantages to these trees. Firstly, they normally provide a fruit that can be sold at market, which is obviously really beneficial to the, uh, the subsistence farmers because obviously a lot of their plants might struggle to produce sort of things that they can sell in the hot desert conditions. On top of that, it provides really good quality firewood. And, perhaps even more importantly, it provides shade. Now that shade is beneficial because it allows um, people to grow crops and farm in between the trees and the crops obviously benefit from being in the cooler shade. On top of that, deep roots stabilise the soil and are reducing soil erosion. So, you know, these trees have been really successful. They've reduced soil erosion. They've also stabilised the sand dunes so that these no longer get blown around and block things such as the major roads through the area. And we've also seen earlier on how the creation of a canal through the far desert has allowed for irrigation and therefore commercial farming. However, there is a slight problem. The irrigation at times hasn't been done particularly well. And as a result of that, we've seen large amounts of water sitting on the surface, and then this has evaporated and left the salt behind, and has actually resulted in increased desertification in the far desert. 